Medirios. Hello again, it's David McGillivray here and this is, uh, little did you know, a chat show in which I talk to people I find interesting and I hope you agree. Now this week I'm in uh, the South London home of my guest. My feeling, he's a very old friend, I, I have a feeling we met in 1979. At that time I was working for BBC Radio London and he was an habitué of a cinema club called the Starlight, which was, it's no longer there, in London's Mayfair Hotel. Um, it's got a fascinating history. That's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, but also I want to know what he was doing when I first met him. Was he a, a stockbroker? Was he a star of radio and TV or a film reviewer? Maybe. He was uh, studying at King's College. There we have the whole background, and now we get all the facts from my guest, the very wonderful Simon Rose. Hello, oh, David. Oh, Simon. Hello. So nice to see you after so, so long. It's been a few years, hasn't it? Yes, I was indeed a student when we first met. Aha! That answers my first question then. Um, but because we haven't met uh, for a while, I had to do a bit of research on you. And uh, according to your various uh, biographies online, I'm inferring you have two main interests, correct me if I'm wrong, films and money. Well, I've done a lot of work connected with money. Sadly, it hasn't always meant that much of it has gone my way. But yes, I've written and broadcast about money for quite a long time. But film probably was my first interest, and that is how we met. I'd grown up in... Newcastle upon Tyne. You can tell from the accent. I want you to do a Geordie accent later, Simon. Oh, Please right. carry on. <laughs> yes, that'll be in the special pay for that <laughs> bit. Um, and I got it. There was a cinema up there, which was an offshoot of the BFI, called the Tyneside Cinema, with Sheila Whitaker then doing the programming. And they had the most eclectic mix of films. There was a French existential movie called Celine and Jolie Go Boating, which was I think three and a quarter hours one day. And then Liza Minnelli and Burt Reynolds the following day in something called Lucky Lady. Perfect. And I, you know, I was at that age where you would soak up any sort of movie. I don't think I would. I'd probably go for the Burt Reynolds one now, but it was just fantastic. So I was really obsessed with film, but I didn't know that much about classic film. And when I came to London, I was a student. I discovered this extraordinary cinema club, very small, more like a preview theatre in the basement of the Mayfair Hotel. It had about thirty to forty seats with armchairs in the front row, and they showed two old Hollywood movies every night. Just fantastic, most clearly black and white. I was a student, didn't have much money, loved going there. First of all, we discovered you could get drinks from the bar. But of course, being the Mayfair Hotel, if you were only a student, it was pretty expensive. But then we discovered that you could take drinks in from home. Nobody was going to know, it was dark. So we'd smuggle a bottle in, you'd pull a cork, no screw caps in those days, as Humphrey Bogart pulled out the gun and pulled the trigger. And the ashtrays were so scrupulously clean, we'd bring in nuts and put those in. It was wonderful. It was like our own little preview theatre. But eventually, it cost so much money, I became the projectionist. Ah, oh, now I'd completely um, forgotten that. Now, my feeling again is that we were doing um, a series on interesting cinemas that Londoners might not have known about. Um, I came to the Starlight and then, um, is it true you came into the studios of BBC Radio London and we had a chat? I, I think so. It's so long ago. The problem was that the cinema club, it wasn't well attended. Uh, and nobody knew about it. So it needed I think the, the Mayfair publicity. had an embarrassment. It needed publicity, but unfortunately, the Mayfair decided they'd rather use the space for something else. So mm. I helped mount a sort of campaign to try and keep it open. I mean, it was such a wonderful place. Of course. When I was projectionist, one night, a lot of the stars who had been in this film would come and see their own movies or their friends' movies. Name, so, name one, please. Ingrid Bergman, no. Patricia Rock and Anne Todd, I was introduced to. I can't mm. even remember the film they came to see. Well, in the old days, I would I would have been able to tell you, but that is astonishing. Oh, it was just wonderful. Do Sadly, you... it closed. It did. Despite your help. Uh, we did our best, <laughs> Simon. Um, now, do you know what that little preview theatre was doing in the Mayfair Hotel? I No, I don't. I mean, I remember, all I remember is this lovely chap called Brian Wood, but not particularly good toupee who oh. knew all these stars so you'd, you'd often go and tell him that you've got the film set up and he'd be he'd be 
having coffee or tea with somebody who he expected you to recognise, but of course you knew them from their films 50 years earlier. It wasn't always mm. very easy. <laughs> but he... Oh, um, do. do. Or I never d really did discover me. how it had ever started. Oh. But I do know my favourite moment, apart from beating those wonderful stars, was we showed the first new print of Hitchcock's Rebecca since it had been made. So they had a, it was a new print made, I think, for the Gate Cinema chain. We showed it. My first experience of Rebecca was watching through the projection window. I, I, I hope that was a packed house. I can't remember. It's too long ago to remember. Oh, yeah. Remember, let me tell you, Simon, yeah. <clears throat> that the preview theatre was specially built for a couple of American producers called the Danzigers who lived in the hotel and they had this room converted to their own preview theatre and that's where they ran their rushes. I did not know that. Isn't that fascinating? The Danzigers have turned up on this series uh, Which um, is before. why it looks so much like <coughs> some preview theatre, of course. That's actually fantastic. It but did. it did mean that I got to know a lot of <laughs> classic movies, particularly... Actually, they seem to specialise, from what I remember, much more in the American than the British. I've got a fondness for British classic movies, but it was mostly American. I, mean, I must was. have seen all of Humphrey Bogart, <coughs> Jimmy Cagney's films and Catherine Hepburn and all these wonderful people there. Now, we uh, teased you mercilessly, Simon, I remember, at Radio London. Uh, we claimed that 90% of the audience appeared to be gay. And you said, I've never noticed that. Do you remember that? I don't. I, I have a My gay has never been particularly uh, astute. Um, my, the I'm fairly are, sure that Brian Wood, who ran it, might have been a little <laughs> camp. <laughs> to... Who knows? I, I mean, I, I mean, my mum in Newcastle worked for the local theatre. Um, I, ne I never knew what predilection people had at all. It wasn't really very important. Oh, well, I expect you caught up, Simon. Now, is it true that um, because we met over the business of the Starlight Theatre, that I then invited you to work on my film The Errand, only a few months later. I believe that is right. Uh, the Errand is my one time appearing in a proper, a short film rather than a feature film, perhaps. But I'm sure that it was my opening of that gate, Dress as Security Guard, that really gave the film it's in, its, its finesse. It's in the first shot of the film... Um, it, it is, I believe, your one and only appearance as an actor. Um, I'm obviously going to hold this up here. Um, it's Short Sharp Shocks, a Blu-ray from uh, the BFI. And um, uh, you may know that uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber, you get one of these free. Oh, aren't you? Well, here's the link. It's coming up now. The Errand is on this Blu-ray along with uh, a lot of other very rare shorts. So, um, uh, but it was very exciting. This was my you, first experience of seeing it? filmmaking. Ah, well, um, of of a kind, yes. Oh, but it was, it one, was It was the the State Newington Pumping Station, I think, which is rather splendid. It was a great location, and I was a, I was a gopher as well. I think, wasn't I? I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Simon, because I'm going to uh, mention something else um, to you now. Let's see if you uh, remember what this reference means. Has your driving improved? Um, I don't remember the accident. I remember I was gophering a retractable knife that was needed. I was driving my mum's car. I was too young to have my own car. And yeah, I had an accident that meant I could no, I was no longer incredibly useful to the production. For some reason, it was my gophering that seemed to be more useful to me than my opening a gate dressed as a soldier. You were vital in both <laughs> roles, Simon. I can now remind you because... Um, it's in my diary. This incident happened Brief. on... I've August... just seen your diary. What an incredibly neat handwriting. <coughs> and in mauve. You are. August the 6th, 1980. Oh. A most unexpected thing happened today. I had met Simon Rose at Baptie's. Yes, that's the gun hire company. And after collecting the knives, you're correct, we drove out of the car park and were hit by another car coming down the road. This was my first car accident. Your, yours even, as well, I I hadn't even remembered you were with me. It's true. 
I hadn't seen the approaching car at all. It, well, I've got Simon's father's car. I may have been wrong there. It had one of its headlights smashed. The other car was much more badly damaged, but there weren't any injuries, although I hurt my knee. Simon and the driver of the other car did a lot of scribbling. I was happy enough to wait around for that. But when Simon said he could no longer drive up to the location... I had a fit. <laughs> <laughs> See, I remember almost none of that. Gosh! How old were you? Oh, I'm 20 ish, I can't remember. Student <coughs> says something like 20, 20, 20, 22, something like that. Uh, something like 22. Do excuse me. No, I'm going to talk a little bit now while he mm. drinks water and gets rid of his, um, his cough. Thank you, Simon. Carry I do on. That dreadful, dreadful start to speeches I used to do. Oh. I used to start going, Je ne veux pas l'unité, mais. <coughs> Je ne veux pas l'unité. No, I'm terribly sorry. I've got a frog in my throat. Oh, yes. very sort of good. Joke you can't do anymore. Except I... on your, your <laughs> interviews. And in my pantos, possibly. Yes. Now, um, so as a result of appearing in the errand and doing all the uh, dirty work. <coughs> This has never happened before. I hope you're finding it entertaining. <coughs> Due to your work on the errand, you obviously decided that you must get into showbiz. Is that right? <laughs> I had a long detour first. I had worked when as a student for BBC Radio quite a lot. I'd, I'd, it's a flashback to Newcastle. So I'd, I'd tried to get into Oxbridge with a third year sixth when I also discovered drinking, and drinking seemed to me to be much more interesting than trying to get into Oxford or Cambridge. And so I flunked, and I had nine months in which to do whatever I wanted. I tried a little bit in a bank, which was staggeringly tedious. So I went to work backstage in the local theatre where my mother had worked doing PR. They'd had their grant withdrawn. So basically, if you were working there, you did absolutely everything. You only got paid for get-ins and get-outs when productions came in and went out. But I loved it, and one of the productions a musical version of Alvin Toffler's Future Shop went up to the Edinburgh Festival, to the Fringe, and I went up with it. It was an interesting experience. I lived with a rock band who'd never gone north of the Tyne before, called Circus with a K, who used to take substances at night, so I would lock myself in my room, being a very impressionable young man, I didn't want anything to do with them. You're but, gro growing up fast, yes. Simon. But I did meet a lot of people from the Beeb there, because they, uh. they would do a radio show every night from the festival. Brian Matthew, I think, might have been the host. He was. But I was really interested. I, I liked all the SMs, the studio managers. That's not sadomasochism, is it? No, studio managers. Sorry. Though they may argue that the two things are interwoven. Uh, and also met uh, John Lloyd, who was then just a very little-known radio producer. Ah. And when I came to London to university straight afterwards, I used to go along and watch lots of radio shows mm -hmm. and I used to like hanging around afterwards so that that felt like showbiz to me yes. the captain's cabin I think it was called the captain's table around the side of the Paris studio oh, how in lower region street anyway so John Lloyd had just started doing a program with Bernard Braden and he said his researcher had let him down and as oh. a precocious young man I said if I can get you some stuff can I have a job and so I worked as a researcher on that program on um uh, news quiz, the very early news quiz. You I did. <clears throat> put those funny little things from newspapers in between each round. And I worked on weekending and news headlines. Um, so that was really my experience of, of showbiz then. Now, s sometime later, while we're talking about uh, Radio Simon, um, you worked with a, a friend of mine who's also been on this show uh, called Karen Krasanovich. Oh, yes. Uh, and you were working on LBC. <clears throat> remember that? I do remember what that. What were you doing? It, strictly speaking, it was called London News Talk. LBC's had some trouble with the licence, so there was sort of an interregnum of about nine months when they had to sort of pretend it wasn't the same station, so they need some new blood. Karen and I managed to sort of somehow kibitz our way into getting it. And we did a show called The Net every Saturday and Sunday. I think I did Sunday on my own. Karen did Saturday with me. And it was just entertainment, what was on in London. So long ago, we believed we were the first radio programme ever to have access from email. Oh, my goodness. So it's quite a long time ago. So the two of you were just chatting, were you? Like we're there doing now. There was quite now. a lot of chatting. We, we had guests. Somebody would come in and talk about theatre, about comedy, yes. about music. Mm. There was even one wonderful person come in and talk about new alcohol. 
Oh, I remember trying Maker's Mark for the first time on air. You tried what? Maker's Mark. It's an American bourbon. Thank Very you. Nice. And how is it working with Karen Krasanovich? She will be watching this, so be, <laughs> so be very careful. I used to get irritated that Karen wouldn't prepare much in advance. But because she's such a pro, she doesn't really need to. Mm. So she would just go with the flow. Oh. I think Victoria Corrin, or Corrin Mitchell, as she now was, did comedy for us. Who else we had people talking about was on TV. It was, it was actually a very good show. But well, when I, LBC got its licence back... That was the end of that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry I missed it. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Phil, uh, back to films. Yes. So, uh, not in this house we're in now, but in a previous house. I remember, can't put a date on it, I came round, uh, I think you were having a party, and I think you were showing an 8 millimeter uh, film. I'm not sure about that. Maybe it was 16, I don't know. Or was it? Had we got into video by that time? Anyway, the point is that you were showing North by Northwest and you pointed something out in that film oh, yes. that none of us had ever seen before. Well, I... When you were... I had a spell as film reviewing. And for the when day, you're watching for the films... Mirror. For the Mirror and for many other people as well. The Mirror was the big gig. But sometimes when you're watching a film, you're not completely absorbed. And I had begun noticing odd things that I liked pointing out. Now, the North by Northwest one, I think somebody told me. But when Eve Marie Saint pretends to shoot Cary Grant in the Mountaintop Cafe, in the background, they have clearly done this shot before. Because a little boy, as he raises the gun, puts his fingers in his ears. Mm. Once seen, you can't unsee it. Absolutely. But I had never yeah. noticed it before. It was, only, it was only when somebody pointed it out, and I watched the film for what must have been the third or fourth time, that I saw it. Well, but now, of course, it's the highlight of the movie for me. Well, we were astounded. Um, I remember distinctly. <laughs> How is it that we have never noticed that before? You're so right in that now when that clip comes up, you're only looking <laughs> at that boy. Yes. But did you... Um, this is way... Um, uh, before bloopers became cultish. You know, everyone watches yes. out for bloopers now. But were you noticing a few of those at the time? Yes, I would see quite a lot. And I did, I'm, I'm doing things out of order, but I did write a couple of film guides and putting the bloopers in, yes. in a day when they weren't really very commonly seen, I think was one of the more interesting things. However... Um, it was the early days of the internet. I didn't really know much about computers, and I can't help feeling that if we'd actually put the blasted things online, as two guys in Cardiff were doing, mm. we looked at this online database done in ASCII. The old, oh. Young people won't know what ASCII is, but it's basically, imagine the internet with no formatting for anything. <laughs> it, that's what it was. And there was a dreadful database from two young students in Cardiff, but that's what became the IMDB and got uh. sold for, I think, $30 million at some stage. But it just never occurred to me. I still liked books. Yes. But and of course, all, all those uh, aforementioned bloopers are now on IMDb. Yes, exactly. So you can't surprise anybody anymore. No. No. Everybody has noticed everything. I just want one more of your favourites, Simon. Well, can, can I dive out from that slightly? Because the other thing I loved were films that were so bad oh, that yeah. they were good. Me too. And they don't exist to the same extent, but there was a spell of them. I thought... And what was it, 92 or something? I can't remember the exact year. Shining Through with Michael Douglas and Lenny Griffith is the most wonderful film that is so bad that it's good, particularly as it's got such an enormous budget. It is just full of things that make absolutely no sense and dialogue that is wonderful. Uh, bombs were raining down on London in a hailstorm they called The Blitz. I knew it happened on a Friday because the next day was Saturday. Mine got you've got guts. It's just full of these gorgeous things. Melanie Griffith is sent by the American OSS, the Secret Service, into Germany. Her qualification seems to be because she can bake strudel. Of course. There are secret plans with big red crosses on them. Michael Douglas goes in, speaking no German, has a little card saying he can't speak because he's, he's been wounded in the war. But nothing explains why he can't understand the language either. It's just absolutely wonderful. You are one of these amazing people who can remember lines of dialogue from films. You just... Only a few. Well, you reeled off three beauties oh, because there. I talk about I talk about it so often. There are some people I'm, I'm sure you know as well who will come out of a film preview who don't take notes and can remember lines mm, of dialogue. I can't not do me, that. Not me. No, everything has to be uh, written down. Um, we're coming up to a break, uh, Simon. But before that happens, 
I've uh, I mentioned it before. I'm going to have to hold uh, you to it. I'm told you can do a Geordie accent. Where are you? If you grow up in Newcastle and you talk the way I normally do, there are certain pubs you wouldn't go into. So you've got to actually, as a defence mechanism, if nothing else, you've got to be able to talk like this. Besides which, I think it's actually a really pretty impressive um, accent. I like the Geordie accent. It's so many people's favourite accent, but it's very hard to do. Now, you can do it because you were up yes. there for how long? Uh, from two until 20, so 18 oh. years. Did you used to talk like that for real? No, only if, only as a defence mechanism, by and large. <laughs> a, a little very funny aside, very briefly, because I know when we take a break. Mm. My daughter went to university in Newcastle, chance for me to go back. She was in Hall of Residence the first year. They were convinced they had an Eastern European cleaner. Until right at the end, one of their friends who was a local came and started chatting to the cleaner. And they realised, no, they were Geordie. And they ah. understood a word this woman had said <laughs> the entire year. Oh, that is absolutely wonderful. And we're going to mention your daughter again in part two of the show. But right now, we're just going to take the quickest break to have a look at a trailer for a peccadillo film. This one is a romance from the Netherlands, and it's called Just Friends. It looks lovely. Have a look at this, and then please join us again in a couple of minutes. Paula er? Nee, ik heb een nieuwe Paula. Zo, dus jij bent een apengatje. Chat. Jongens. En billetjes naar voren, vanaf hier. Voel je hem? Ja. Hij is zo lief. Fucking lekker. Dat zijn flikkers of niet? Flikkertje, flikkertje, flikkertje. Wat de fuck is er mis met jou, gast? Hey! Het is zo fucking dom wat je doet. Kijk. Is net een piemel. <laughs> Jesus. Homo. Medirios, this is uh, David McGillivray on Little Did You Know, and that was Just Friends, and that uh, was only released on uh, a DVD, so you might not uh, have come across it, but now it's everywhere, including on peccadillopod.com. This is my special guest this week. It's uh, Simon Rose. Um, one of the Simon Roses. Did you know there's another Simon Rose also working in radio? I didn't know that. I know there's a children's author in Canada called Simon Rose. Correct. Much more successful than me. Oh, is that possible? I'm sort of hoping maybe his royalty checks might come to me by mistake. Have it hasn't you happened never yet. had one by mistake? What a but shame. I don't know. There's another one in radio, no. Uh, there is. Simon Rose works for V2 Radio, S <coughs> radio Sussex. How about that? No. I don't think it's me. I've got a bad memory, it's but not. I'm sure I'd know if I was doing that. It's not. I did the research. Oh. He looks nothing like you. And I was going to say, <laughs> have you ever met? Sadly, no. Would you like to? I don't know. But... I mean, of course, um, Dave Gorman did, you know, made his career out of going and finding all the Dave Gormans around the world. Correct. Whether I'd have much of an interest in doing that with Simon Rose, I don't know. No. No. Well, there's another David McGillivray as well, and he's a, yes, he's a ballet dancer in Canada. <clears throat> I don't meet him. I don't get his royalty checks either, <laughs> and I've got no plans to go to Canada. We spoke about this uh, in the first part only briefly, uh, Simon. You have, uh, we're going to have a look at them in uh, the Patreon footage, but you've written a couple of film guides. Now, this was in the day when there were so many of these books. We're going to have to explain what they were because now True. none of them exist. The last one 
uh, Radio Times Film Guide folded last year. You wrote two. What were they? Yes, yes I have a habit of, of trying to do things in, in sort of doomed industries or little niches. But it, there were a lot of film guides. These were books that companions took to refer to if you were interested in movies. The big one in the UK was Leslie Halliwell who was fantastic. Both Film Guide and the Film Goer's Companion, they were fantastic. In the back, it has his favourite films. I remember working through, making sure I'd seen all his favourite movies because he was a big fan of British classic films. But I felt that there was a gap because when I was watching a movie, something the Radio Times did, but none of the other film guides did, was it actually told you who was playing what part. And I used to find it very irritating when I was watching a video or a film on TV, not knowing who people were. You know, you've got that vague feeling that you recognise them from somewhere, but who are they? So I put that in. I would put in odd facts about the film. I would put in bloopers because, you know, I loved those yes. quotes from the movie. So basically you could bone up on the film and without even watching it, you could maintain that you knew a lot about it. That was the idea anyway. So in those days, people would have these books beside them while they were watching uh, films on TV. Well, mm. just to credit you with them, it's the classic film guide and the uh, One FM essential yes. film guide. Yes. That's because you were in with Radio One, wasn't I it? I was, bizarrely. You know I'm not the trendiest people but I was actually Radio One's film critic for a while. They had a news program called Newsbeat. I was on Newsbeat. Sybil Rusco, I seem to remember. Oh Frank Bartridge. Long, long time ago. We're going way, way back. We are. We're just going to mention briefly um your uh, novel um because that's Filthy Luca and that's got money in the title as well. This is a comic novel about money, isn't it? It is. I, I did a couple of books on the stock market, but I did want to write a, a novel. And I thought, given that I'd worked in the city and then worked in um, finance, reporting on finance and business, that I'd like to do something in that field. So it was a sort of, well, I'm going to use Tom Sharp as a reference. Of course, many younger people won't even know that Tom Sharp, one of the greatest farceurs in literature in English. Um, so it was a novel in that sort of vein, but set in the sort of business community with a Robert Maxwell type character. But even Robert Maxwell, they don't understand now. Oh, alas, it was a long time ago, uh, Simon. Um, did you make any money out of this book, as it's about money? Well, luckily, I got an advance. In those oh, days, no. it was still possible to get an mm. advance. It certainly didn't make very much money. You That's did, despite yeah. the fact, I remember going into shops, it had a very white cover mm. with a lovely illustration. But white, of course, gathers dust, as I realised. So I would go into mm. shops and dust the copies <laughs> to make sure they look more appealing. <laughs> that and doing what all authors do, which, of course, is signing copies as well, because then we all believe, I don't even know if it's true, that the bookshop couldn't then send it back. Oh, is that the reason? Um, did you sell the film rights? No. Oh. I'm trying to think if anybody was actually interested. I don't. Don't remember there being much excitement over the the film rights to it. <sighs> Sadly not. Uh, too bad. Um, this is a book I want desperately to talk to you about uh, because it intrigues me. It's got an intriguing uh, title, uh, Complete and Utter Zebu. Is that the pr uh, correct pronunciation? Zebu, I see. Zebu. And this involves, um, uh, well, it's about deceit and it's about fascinating facts. And it involves your daughter again, doesn't it? Gosh, I can't, I can't even remember that. You're going to have to tell can, me again your I memory can, or your research. Is I, so much can better cue, than I can cue you, yes. Well, first of all, tell us what the book's about. So I've done two or three books with a, a friend of mine, um, Steve Kaplan. Um, we'll come back to those maybe in the Patreon section. But this was about has how we realised that you couldn't really trust people much anymore, particularly in people in a position of authority, companies, politicians, everybody just seemed to be lying to us. So we really just went around and researched lots of things that were untrue. The reason it's called Zebu is that there was a chain of pubs that was supposedly selling steak, but somebody discovered it wasn't actually what you and I would consider coming from a cow. It came from a <laughs> South African cross called a zebu that was a cross between cattle and I can't remember if it was a zebra and a cattle. Anyway, it wasn't what you and I would consider a cow grazing in a, a bucolic field. Um, so, uh, th of course, this is absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, but apparently, uh, according to one of your articles online, you were inspired to write this because your daughter was gulled into buying or having what she thought was a free credit card. Oh, now I vaguely remember that. Well, that was one of the problems. It was a scam. Yes, yes. 
Well, I can't really remember it very well, but I do remember trying to warn my kids never to have anything like that. It is so easy to lose control of your finances if you don't know what you're doing. Well, I, I can tell you, because I've only recently read it, so I can tell you what happened. She was encouraged to buy what, to have, I'm sorry, what was described as a loyalty card and oh, then yes. realised when she got her bank statement she'd been charged for it. I do remember that vaguely. It took us a long time to unwind that. I thought that was absolutely extraordinary. But I'm afraid... Well, it's that, wicked because yes. she was about 18, yeah, yeah. you know. And a very keen shopper, of course. Yes, so, of course. So she would be very loyal to any shop that wanted to give her anything. So we, we need people like you to reveal these uh, scams. Can you... I wish I could... I can't remember very many more of them, I'm sorry to say. Oh, well, I wish well, I could well, say that I felt that society had become more honourable and we could trust people more, but I suspect it's gone entirely it's worse. the other way. It's worse, Simon. And, I, and part of the problem, I feel, is the abolition of, of cash. I am. I mean, you and I remember proper cash, but actually, it felt like spending money. I mean, one of the big problems if you use a piece of plastic, especially if you're not even having to sign or tap in a number, it doesn't feel like you're spending money. But believe me, it still it still makes your bank balance go down. It's true. Do you still use cash, Simon? Whenever I can. I but do. But since the pandemic, it has become a little mm. bit more difficult. Well, some um, people won't accept it. I know, but that just makes me even cross. Oh. So I want to use it even more. Yes, <laughs> you I and cash. I like cash. Both. I like the feel of money. I though do. The plasticization of our banknotes doesn't please me. Will Will we go cashless within the next ten years? I'm worried that we might. If we're being serious for a moment, there are something like a million people in the country, mainly towards the elderly, but also people who've got into financial trouble and are not allowed bank accounts who depend upon cash. And I know there are people, Natalie C Cini, who used to be the, um, the financial ombudsman, who are campaigning to try and stop it. But of course, you know, the voice of the elderly, as so often, is not really heard in society. But I, I think getting rid of cash is a, an incredibly bad thing. Apart from anything else, all governments around the world are heavily in debt. They want, ideally, and their central bankers to go for negative interest rates. The moment we get free banking in this country, if there is no cash, there is nothing to stop them actually just charging much more for your bank account. Or if they go for negative interest rates, which many countries already have, but not for personal customers, then frankly, your money is actually going to be stolen from you by governments. I I think we're facing more trouble as, as well. Yes, yes, I agree. I want to get back to films. That was uh, very serious, wasn't it? We got just a little bit serious there, but we, uh, we want to cover all sorts of things on this show. I'm going to go back to films, though, uh, and, and this is because um, uh, one film you produced, which I haven't seen, absolutely intrigues me like a, z a, a zebu and it was the first interactive film you're going to have to explain exactly what it okay. was it's called running time it is i don't imagine many people have heard of it um so we had or i had an idea that with the internet and this was again very early as the internet it's before almost anybody had broadband yes uh, we were all using these dial-up modems that made this sort of <laughs> noise all the time. You've probably seen it in old movies. Yes. <laughs> um, but we had this idea that you could get the public to say how a movie would go. You'd make a little bit. We had this thriller called Running Time. We'd come up with three possible endings. We had a team of writers. The public would vote on which way they wanted the drama to go. We hadn't written any more of it. And then we'd have to go off scout locations, write it, uh, film it and get it up for the following week. It was an intriguing idea, but as a way of making money, it lacked a certain something, namely income. Um, it was the top of the dot-com bubble, very late 1999 into 2000. People wanted to give money to anything that had anything to do with the internet, frankly. A lot of people at a very respectable financial firm who had more money than cents um, gave it to us. Now, the most important, sense. most important thing, Simon, is that you were the first... This True. was the first film True. of its kind. Well, so, I did, I did, well, there was a big name involved. Simon Beaufort, who'd become a friend of mine, who'd written The Full Monty at that stage. I don't think he'd done Slumdog Millionaire by then. But he liked the idea. He, he'd always been interested in different ways of creating things. Um, and so he was involved as well. But in retrospect, we should have looked 
not just at the excitement of making the film, but how we might actually be able to make any money. And also, because Borbland wasn't universal, it was very hard for people to watch even short movies online. So how were people watching it? There weren't laptops either, were there? No, watching on your computer at home. But you had to wait for ages for it to download if you didn't have broadband. Of course. So we were sort of ahead of time, but also with a rather flawed financial model. And Netflix did something recently that was along similar veins. Um, but you may remember, you know, gamers used to have this sort of thing where you would you would have game books where you would go to a certain page if you said yes, a different page if you went no. It was like a version of that. It but was the... fun and it was interesting, but it lost a surprising amount of money in a very short time. Everything comes back to money with with Simon. He, but then it it, well, it, it is his job. It, as you know, even when even when you made the errand, you needed money in order to make it. You can't do everything on favours. No, no, we 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 lost all our money as well. Of course, it was all done for love. Yes. Now, can running time be viewed in any form today? I don't think it can. Mm. One of the problems was we used um, had a wonderful wonderful. Um, music, uh, I can't think of what it's called, supervisor, who would come across this band in a pub that she thought were going places, um, called Coldplay. And oh, we used some no. of their music when they don't, I don't think they'd even actually made a record, they may have done a single. So a lot of it had Coldplay music on, and of course we can't use that of anymore. Course. We have the rights for a short time. We also had a, a wonderful um, movie composer called Alex Jeffers, who did us um, some music for our news um, flashes, a wonderful, wonderful news thing, which again we lost the rights after a while. But I've heard it come up in other films that he's been scoring. So it's very odd. You suddenly hear this flash of stuff you remember. Uh, but no, I don't think it exists at that time. Of course, uh, I think I, we put it on lots of um, DVDs, but I kept them somewhere where the sun got at them, oh, and they're no. now unplayable. <sighs> but it wouldn't it wouldn't work as a film to watch from beginning to end no. because you had to understand why we made it. It was flawed but interesting, and as you say, we were the first. I want to talk about another film because front page of the you, Guardian. Uh, front page of the Guardian. I hope you've still got that copy somewhere. Yes. Good. <clears throat> another film. This this is one you wrote. Yes. And uh, it's called The Flying Scotsman. It's it's about um, somebody whose name is not familiar. Uh, now we're going back. When did you do this? Two thousand and six. My goodness, yes. Graham Aubrey. Um, he was a, a champion uh, cyclist. How come you made a film about him? So, as we mentioned, I was a film reviewer for a while. You see a lot of dull films, and I suspect almost every film you've read at one stage or another has thought, God, I can do better than this. I wanted to write a film. I'd had my appetite whetted, of course, by working on the errand, where you saw the excitement, the glamour of, of going and getting knives and trashing cars. Um, and... I saw a Channel 4 documentary about cycling. Mm. I had no interest in sport, really, no interest in cycling, but I just loved this sort of Al Tupper of the track type story about this slightly bonkers Scotsman called Graham Obrey, who had ridden against this man called Chris Baldwin, who more people then had heard of. Britain was not a big cycling country, but Baldwin, with the help of Group Lotus and a million pound superbike, had won the Barcelona Olympics, which would have been I can't even remember when, early 90s, I guess. Correct. Graham thought, well, hang on. He'd got two kids, I think, a bike cycle shop that was going under, a mortgage, he was in debt. And he just said to himself, well, I've, be I've beaten Baldwin occasionally. Maybe I could beat him. The problem was Baldwin had this £1 million superbike. Graham O'Brien had nothing. Um, what he had, though, was a mind that just worked in different ways for everybody else. He built a bike with a completely different design, where he squashed himself down on the handlebars to reduce um, uh, the aerodynamic resistance. He used bits of a washing machine so the bearings went fast, bits of an old padlock. He found anything he could make. And he decided to uh, get the world one hour record. He got it. The cycling authorities shot on him from a great height. He got the record again. It was absolutely amazing. And I thought that would make a great film. And um, a, a very successful film as well. If we judge success by scores on the aforementioned IMDb. So at the moment, The Flying Scotsman has 7.1, which is very high. It's higher than any of my films, I can tell you. Oh, did you make any money out of this one, Simon? I, I got some money early on, but then I ran into development hell. Mm. British films, as you know, 
they'll often have sources of finance from different places. I think we had 14 different sources of finance. The producer had to keep the script moving because there's nothing else you can do to change it. And after a while, I felt I'm being asked to do yet another free rewrite. I didn't want to. It took 14 years from conception to completion. It did open the Edinburgh Film Festival, partly, I suspect, because of the word Scotsman in the title. <laughs> um, but unlike many of your films, of course, um, cycling enthusiasts will watch any film about cycling, not just Breaking Away, which is the good one. And I suspect they probably bump the score up. It's a perfectly nice film with Johnny Lee Miller, Brian Cox. It's not all my work. There were other writers on it. It's got a few good lines in it, and it's it's still a really interesting story. And this one does still exist. <laughs> this does exist. Douglas McKinnon was the director also at the time, having sort of trouble getting work, but since he's done Doctor Who and he's done um, Good Omens mm. now, and Douglas has gone on to greater things. I'm going to watch it uh, when it uh, turns up on TV again. I can tell you. Good. Now, um... Don't forget to vote on IMDb. And that too... Yeah, so, score slightly higher than seven. It'll go, it'll go up to 7.2 by mm -hmm. the time I've finished with it. Now, you um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're an after-dinner speaker. And uh, um, this is something I picked up on, online as well, and I want to talk about it. This is a, a quote from you. Famous movies carry vital lessons for life. This is, I think, one of the things you've talked about after dinner. Now, I agree with you about this. So can we talk about films that have got something to teach us? You, I cannot now remember. I've done that talk once so many years ago. I can't remember a bally thing about it. Am I going to have to cue you again, Simon? Yeah, I'm sure you will. <laughs> David, you have to realise, I did tell you when you first suggested mm. this idea that I had quite a bad memory, but it's clearly, you're reminding me more about my life than I can recall myself. It's my pleasure, Simon. Now, the, the film that has taught me more about life than any other is... Dramatic pause, <laughs> I like those. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. Okay. Okay, so what you Don't learn... wear slippers that are too tight for you? <laughs> No, please. No, mine, no. Mine are very comfortable. You don't. Not red ruby slippers. He is wearing slippers at the moment. I can vouch for that, everybody. Um, no, what you learn uh, from The Wizard of Oz, among many other things, is that you don't need a brain if you've got a diploma. <laughs> Everyone will just assume that you're clever. Now, that is very important. That's true. I mean, I did go to university, although I was working for the Beeb as a researcher and comedy writer for a long time. I did go back and get my exam. I don't think anybody's ever asked what degree I got. I think the ability to bullshit or to have a requisite piece of paper is incredibly useful. There you if go. you can get away with it. There you go. Well, I always got away with it as well. Uh, nobody has ever asked uh, for anything from me. Um, so I really don't, don't know why I'm bothered. Oh. Uh, Perhaps you learned lots of other useful life lessons at the time. What did you study? I've, I've never studied anything. All I've done is uh, watch the telly. I've learned a lot off that machine, I can tell you, because I love documentaries. Yes, but one of my least favourite. Documentaries? Films, yes. Oh. Though, though I always then, when documentaries occasion would come up in the in the cinema, things like Senna or the Buena Vista yes. Social Club, I would find if I was forced to watch them, they're absolutely wonderful. Oh, but uh, I tend to like things with stories, though of course you would argue that documentaries have stories. And of course the documentary about Graham O'Brien changed my oh. life completely for many years. Mm, precisely. Yeah. Um, uh, can we talk about other interests uh, of yours, um, Simon? Yes. I know, I know you're yes, not... as long as we're not going to go exactly where you think, I think you're going. Well, you're not going to give us a concert, I know, <laughs> but when did you learn how to play the ukulele? Um, I came from a sort of musical family. My mum was a very keen violinist. She worked for an orchestra in Newcastle, and I grew up playing the piano and the cello in the way you do when your parents sort of persuade you to play things. The only really interesting time was when The Sting came out, going back to films again, and I got into ragtime and set up a ragtime band where I played ragtime piano in pubs. But I played less and less because the, you know, the cello and the piano are not terribly sociable instruments. And I was going out with somebody a few years ago who was a keen guitarist, who for reasons now lost in the mists of time, bought me a ukulele for Christmas. And I really rather enjoyed it. We go to pub occasionally, lots of people playing pop songs together and just singing very badly. But it's it's fun and it's it actually makes you feel quite happy. However, in uh, what year are we now? I can't remember the year, but two or three 2021, years. Twenty twenty one, I think you'll find. 
Well, 2021 now, yes. I'm trying to think of the year I was oh, referring to. I but the Queen's pardon. 92nd birthday oh. concert was in the Albert Hall, full of music that I suspect she possibly wouldn't choose if she had um, the uh, sway over everything. And uh, in the middle of it, uh, there was the George Formby Society playing when I'm playing Windows with uh, Ed Balls, Harry Hill and Frank Skinner. And I thought, this is what I want to be This playing. is the life. Yes. We're going to talk about um, the George Formby Society and many other things, but only on Patreon, I'm afraid, because we've come to the end you of the you. show. That's what I do on this programme. I'm a wicked tease. Now, if you're a Patreon subscriber, as you'll know, you can join us there straight away. Right now, you'll find us waiting for you. And if you're not, uh, here's the link. Uh, again, it's so easy to become um, a member of the gang. Uh, Simon, we have to wrap up here on... Uh, YouTube, thank you so much for oh. hosting me today. But thank you for reminding me about my life. Uh, it's a two-way street, you see. We've both gained from this interview. Join me again uh, next week here on Little Did You Know When my guest will be my old friend David Flint. He's a writer. Um, if it hadn't been for him, there would have been a lot more mistakes in my book, Doing Rude Things. And he also runs an absolutely fascinating site called The Reprobate. And I really do recommend it. He knows so much stuff. Join me for my chat with David Flint next week. But for now, from David McGillivray and my special guest, Simon Rose, it's mwah. Bye. Bye.